Get Pucked. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Get Pucked podcast. Back with the OG trio, Dave in the house with Vito and Matt. Um, and in case if anybody's just listening, I might sound a little different. Have to use the backup headset today. I uh, didn't charge my earbuds. Shame on me. That out of the way, hopefully it's clear. Let's dive into some hockey stuff. So one of the things I kind of wanted to talk about, because I think, again, a little bit like last year, and not to get too ahead of ourselves, but Sean Monaghan requires a little bit of our attention. The Monahab himself is, is, he's rolling. He looked good. He's got the points. He's making everybody around him play better. He is, he is a rejuvenation to the, to the old man line that he's on with Pearson and Gallagher. And so, you know, obviously this begs the question. Um, if he continues, again, let's just go with the assumption, he continues a similar level of play. He doesn't get, oh my God, astronomically better, and he doesn't get, oh my God, terrible. If he continues a similar level of play by trade deadline, if it were up to you, is this something that you, or, or someone I should say, that you dangle as a trade piece and try to maximize what he's done this year to get crazy returns, if possible, if it's out there? Or are you of the mindset that the Habs actually need a Sean Monaghan on their team? He ain't that old. He is a veteran. And he's playing incredibly well. And do you look to kind of maybe lock that up for a couple of years on a good deal? Clearly don't overpay. Let's just make some some general assumptions here. If if you were to lock him up, it would be for a palatable deal and everybody would be happy. And if you trade him, it's trade him for something really good. What would you have a preference for, gentlemen? Dave? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I think you said it there. If, if he play, If he continues with the same level of play as of right now, it's going to be interesting, right? Because he's at a point a point per game pace almost, right? Right now he's he's playing amazing, he's doing well. Um, so you yeah, you'd have to take it. I think the Habs have the luxury of time here. I think that they have a, the luxury of of taking the like whatever half season or three quarters of the season and looking at what they actually have in Sean Monahan. Is he a flash in the pan? Is he playing well, or is it going to endure? And 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 can he stay healthy? Is another uh, key aspect to that, right? And I, I think that will probably dictate what actually happens to Sean Monahan. But for me, if this is the real Sean Monahan and he's back. I'd keep him. I'd keep him. Why not? I think that he's 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 a good addition to this team. Like you said, he's not too old. Veteran presence, and he plays well. And he could center. You know, you'd have a lot of other uh, roster moves you'd have to make to make him make it make sense. But he's a guy I'd look into moving because no one's a, a guarantee, right? Uh, you, you could trade all you want for these top prospects and 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 picks and whatnot and you can see it around the league like nothing's guaranteed anyway so like at one point you have to stop trading for hope and trading and 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 working with what you have and i think that that is a key aspect right here and that's why i would keep sean monahan if he continues playing as he is playing right now no guarantee very very small sample size but so far so good People quickly forget that he's a former sixth overall pick who played very well before he got his injuries. Now, the injuries seem to be behind him. He had his surgery, whatnot. He, came to, he was basically given to Montreal for free just to take on his contract. It's working well. He helps take off some of the pressure off of Nick Suzuki, especially with Kirby Doc going down. And he's been a true pro every night and every time he's been on the ice with the Montreal Canadiens. So... Unless a team really comes out at the trade deadline and blows Montreal out of the water with an offer that like they cannot refuse, you keep him. Because going forward with how young the Montreal Canadiens are, they're the second youngest team in the entire NHL. They're going to need good quality veteran presence. And he's a good quality veteran presence. Now, again, health is still a question mark there with him. So it's a bit of a concern on that front. But I mean... Every game that's passing is becoming less and less of a concern. The thing that I don't want is that we move on from him. You you trade him. He doesn't come back, right? And you go with Kirby Doc as your as your two next year. And unfortunately, he goes down again. And there's nobody there to help relieve some of that pressure on Nick Suzuki's shoulders. We saw what it did last year when we lost Kirby Doc and we lost Sean Monahan. And then Christian Dvorak. It was all Suzuki by himself at that point. Well, yeah, and I, I don't think and it's know necessarily it's a fair to make that. Year. That's a freak, and and you got to have certain contingencies. But I don't believe you you build a team around constantly thinking about 
oh, this guy's gone. We need somebody to plug that hole to be perfect. You know, no, that's just... why you have depth in your AHL. That's why you have depth across the team to kind of take steps like this. But I, I, I get what you're saying. I, 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 I see what you're the saying. way I see it. I think the focus should be more on trying to move somebody like Christian Dvorak once he gets going, once he gets playing. And, 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 you know, you look at Montreal's center lineup next year and for however long they would be able to resign uh, Sean Monaghan. And if it happens to be Suzuki, Doc, and Monaghan is your one, two, three, it's, it's, I'm much more comfortable moving forward with that and then eventually seeing Owen Beck coming in and so on than, than going with, um, you know, having Christian Dvorak there. In addition, if they do have to keep Dvorak, you can plug Monaghan on that first line right wing and it's still so, going to go well. You saw chemistry there. there. That's but it. But to, to Dave's point and what he said is that I, I think going forward they should probably, he's almost a point of game player, if he is truly back to the way he was before the injuries really start to pile up in Calgary, we Montreal's got something here with Sean Monaghan. You nailed it at the end there. Like you were talking about centers for a long time, and I'm like, yes, clearly a good two C could very be an even better three C. For me, if you keep him, I want to eventually get him on that top line. Because they haven't really found the right person yet to be on that top line on the right side. And if you talk to me, if you ask me, Sean Monaghan, where he goes, where he plays, he's elevating the other players too. Could you imagine what an elevated Caulfield, an elevated Suzuki would look like even? I well, think that the thing would is, be the thing is I, I think that they, he would already be playing there if it weren't for losing Doc. And, you know, the moment Christian DeVore came back, that's what you'd probably see, Sean Monaghan playing on the top line right wing. Well, so so that's my point, right? So you have you're you're kind of we kept on talking about they need to find somebody to play on that on that line. They need to find somebody who could who can be the third to the Suzuki and Caulfield. If we actually were able to say, Wow, Monaghan slots there and we can slot him there for the next two, three years if he keeps this level of play, that's that that it's not the superstar right winger that i'm sure some people would want but if he could elevate the game of suzuki and caulfield suddenly he becomes a solid addition to that line and you get your true superstar level caliber out of caulfield and maybe up to 50 goals with that happening and then it's like you know you've you've kind of passed from one hand to another what i like is you see the, the addition. chemistry between them already on the power you play. did last year as well exactly so so from from my perspective like you guys, obviously slightly loaded question when I asked it, but the, the, the notion is, can he stay healthy? Are they comfortable with what was done to him on the offseason to recover? And obviously his play on the ice is showing that he's he's pretty healthy. If not at 100%, he's got to be pretty close, clipping at almost a point a game playing on the third line with uh, Gallagher and Pearson. And so, you know, if you could look into it, and he maintains a level of health, and you're confident that your your new medical team could keep him bang, from getting banged up too much. Yeah, I I actually am leaning more towards. I think they really should keep him around. Again, it, uh, but again, it depends how much. No one's right? going to blow you looked, out of the if, water. No, no, for, I'm not talking about the trade. I'm talking about even if you wanted to extend him, it depends how much he wants, and how much you'll get, and how long that contract is. Because uh, if he's okay. you got yeah. you got to take that into consideration. Because if he's well, looking for that, uh, yes. that last contract, you know, uh, an eight-year deal at uh, seven and a half million, seven million dollars, depending how his season I, goes, I don't think so. That's, that I'm going to give him that anyway. No one's think... going to give him that. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I don't think anyone's going to give him that. I think you could probably sign him to a good deal. I think the Canadians took a flyer on him, showed good faith. He has potential to play on the first line here. I, I think that why, if you're Sean Monahan, realistically. Um, I think you have to be a little bit understanding and a little bit, you know, smart with your decision here and your move here, especially with your injury history. You're not going to get That's an eight-year contract anywhere else. I don't think, at least. So I, I, I agree. So you know, I, I think yet yeah, there's multiple options for Sean Monahan on this club, and I think it's it's exciting because it's a guy who, yeah, you got for free, and not only you got for free, you got, you know, with a good, pretty good asset on the, on the way. <laughs> on the way, so it, it's it's something that I would absolutely look like. I'm done with the, the the picking up assets and trading them. It, it doesn't always work out, and sometimes the asset is the asset. Keep the asset, and uh, and, and I think that that the Canadians have to start focusing here on actually like forget the future for a little bit. Like it, it's starting to get to the now. 
So, you know, training for all these prospects, uh, I'm done with it a bit. I, I, I got to agree. Obviously, you keep your eyes and ears open because you never know. But fundamentally, if Monaghan signs three a three, four year deal, he's basically buying into what the team's doing because by that time, they'll be competitive. That's the whole window. That's what you're looking for. You want him on that team. He's looking to say, listen, if we can get there in two years, even better. Three years, I'm still going to have enough in the in, in reserve. We, I'm a young 32 at that point old-ish, youngish, 32, depending on how many more injuries this guy gets. But I think I think there's a, a good marriage there to be had for sure. Another guy, though, I want to pivot to, kind of the other side of the coin. Slavkovsky, at least from the eye test, okay? My eyes, anyways, <laughs> however good they are, and, and several that I'm hearing about, at the very least, from the eye test is playing well probably some of his better hockey since he's been in the NHL. He's engaged, he skates quicker, he's more uh he's setting up plays. They're not necessarily resulting in goals, which I'll get to in a minute, but he looks good. From the eye test, he looks good. I say everything about that is fine. Now flip it to the other side of the argument. The analytics darlings of the world look at him and they say, "Dear god, what's he still doing in the NHL?" He, he is, from all categories, it doesn't look very good. And there's a lot of sort of follow-up to that saying possibly worthwhile sending him down to the AHL and let him get, you know, rolling there and then bring him up. And so I kind of ask you guys, I kind of already know, again, loaded question, but for the listeners who might not know how you boys feel about analytics versus not, what would you do? What are you, first, what are your impressions of Slikowski? Do you agree with my assessment? Or... Do you see it completely different? And what would you do with it? Do you leave it as is? Do you maybe move him around in the lineup? Or do you send him down? Vito, I know you feel uh, strongly about this topic, so I'll let you go. Listen, there's nothing wrong with sending him down to Laval. Okay, and he gets he gets some reps in, in, in Laval. There's nothing wrong with that. There are some cap implications that are far too advanced and too technical for me to even dive into. But with that, with that being said... He's here. The I, I for people who solely just look at the analytics without watching the games, that's that's not that's not a good way or a good measure to to figure out what a player is doing on the ice. Slavkovsky only played 39 games in his rookie year. We know this already. He got hurt. He didn't play in all as uh, from January up until the preseason. He had. You're seeing some very good moments, and I think honestly, if some of the chances that and passes that he generated uh, to somebody to Anderson and to whomever Newhook at times, if those would have resulted in goals, we probably wouldn't even be talking about this because we'd be saying, you know what, he's scanning the, the game a lot better than he was last year. He's not reaching for the puck as much. He still does it. I think that's something that needs to work, be worked on. Still, his his foot speed's a little bit better. He's he's coming back. He's making some good defensive decisions. He's got, had a few back checks. Some of the passes are really, really good. He's, there's a lot of good things that he's doing on the ice. And at the end of the day, he's 19 years old. His draft year was not a bona fide, oh my God, Connor McDavid is coming in on first overall. Connor Bedard's the, the, the first overall pick. This was a draft that it could have been a coin toss between three and four players. And they went with the player that is likely to pay more dividends down the road with proper development. Now, we... As you can see, I'm going to use an example. Somebody by the name of Kotkaniemi, Montreal, basically lost him through an offer sheet. We know the story there. And look how he's playing now. Patience is key with bigger players, especially even more so with power forwards. Okay? So people just look at the analytics and saying, hey, you know, his stats are bad on only the analytics, but are not watching the game. And they're fans from other teams and fans from this who are just trying to, to crap on a player without watching the games is wrong. But the same can be said for somebody who's just watching the game and not actually focusing on some of the analytics as well. You can't just focus on one point and be like, yeah, this is how I'm going to define this player. Should he go to Laval? And could he go to Laval? Hey, Cole Caulfield was sent to Laval and came back and woke up. You know, uh, Pacioretty back in the day said, I'd rather play in Laval if it means I'm not going to play, or sorry, it was Hamilton at the time. I'd rather play in the AHL than, you know, than be a bottom nine player. And it always worked out. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea for, for Slav to go down to, to, you know, for two to three weeks, build his confidence, and come back. The guy does not need to shoot more. He's got, a, he's got a potent shot when he lets it go. 
but I really, really am against those people who are just focusing on the analytics and telling me that what his war is and all of that and, and just nailing it only on that and basing themselves only on that. So just to summarize your passionate Hopefully. rant right there, yeah, sure. you would not necessarily be opposed to him going down you no. probably slant a little bit more to keep him because to you, he is playing well. It's really chances that he's generating are not resulting in the back of the net. And that's less to do with him and more to do with the, his line mates. That, and that, and I'll just add one more thing. He, it's a rebuilding team. He's under Martin St. Louis coaching and Adam Nicholas. I'm not, I know the NHL is not meant for development, but during a rebuild, like, what do you, what do you, what are you striving here for? Yeah, they're gonna. They're, a, right I now, they're in, a, they're in a playoff position. Everybody's like all, uh, all into that. All oh, the rebuild might be over. It's not. No, no, no. They no could, one's talking rebuild is mistakes. over. They're but make, I think it's like a, it's a matter of confidence, though. I think a lot of people are bringing yeah. that up. Like he's well, got the bagel on the stat sheet. It goes on and on and on. Yeah, is that going to become a how thing? Many so players, hold on, hold on you. Hold on, Dave. I feel like you want to jump in there or something. Well, it's just the confidence thing is that like everyone thinks that oh, sending him to Laval is going to reboost his. What happens if he goes to Laval and has a four game point uh, with no points? How is that going to feel for his confidence? You know what I mean? I, 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 I am strongly like there's not you can never convince me that a demotion is good for confidence ever. There's no argument to that at all. Um, I, I just don't believe in it I, unless you have like extreme i don't know your, your character has to be something else for that to be a motivating factor for you uh or con it's not even mo it's not even about motivation just a, a confidence factor for you i think he's doing fine i think that you have to, to look at it as your veto mentioned it like perfectly and i don't say this often but when he said you know in terms of nhl is not a development league but when you have marty saint louis there it kind of is at the moment you know they're, they're playing no you, you know they're playing with Free, you know, free, right? It's free money that they're playing with because there's no expectations of them. And so they can move on. And, and he's playing well enough. He's not, you know, a disaster by any means. I, I, I could talk about analytics all you want, but at the end of the day, you just, if you watch hockey, you see him. He's not struggling in that sense that when you no. see, you know, there's certain players sometimes you're just like, yeah, this guy is a step behind. He's, he doesn't have it yet. He, his decision making is poor. You don't see that yet. The thing about Slavkovsky is that we were promised. The, the fan base was promised he's in the most NHL ready uh, guy from this draft. That's all you heard all constantly. He's the NHL ready guy. He's the most NHL ready guy. He can play in the NHL right away. He's he's gonna he's a beast. He's a first overall pick. Like I think that got, got kind of overshadowed what he kind of is as a player and kind of raised everybody's expectations a whole bunch. And I think it's time for everyone to just take a step back, let him develop this year, and see what 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 goes on in the future. I'm not saying. Never send him to Laval, but I don't think his play warrants him. And it's a demotion. It's a, and I don't think that that's what we need to do with your eyes. The, right the thing, the thing that's been pissing me off lately, especially these last couple of days, is people actually comparing him to Yakupov and saying that he's might be the biggest bust in uh, first. Th th those are people. Not, those but, are oh people my god! god okay, Come and on. I don't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm only bringing this up because it's, it's so, so stupid. Okay. <laughs> but, Every fan base does this, right? Everyone looks at Shane Wright. Oh, Shane Wright didn't make the team. But you never really – nobody actually watched his, his preseason games. No one knows how he's developing. No one knows. It's just you look at the stats, you look at what's happening, and you just compare. That's what it is. And it's people who haven't watched Habs games. It's people who it's, look at – it's, it's also – And that's it. It's fans of other teams that are trying to rip on fans also. of the Canadians. I mean, that is that is probably mostly where it is. <laughs> if you look at it with anybody who's comparing him to Yakupov, they don't have a hockey brain, a hockey cell in their brain. They're just doing it to get a rise out of people like you who read this and, and you're on the keyboard. How could you do that? Let me find 10. And you know what I mean? Which, uh, okay. which in their defense, it, it worked. You might have caught me on a bad day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's fun. It's not a problem. It's nice to rag on the other team's, uh, uh, you know, prospects, stars. That's what fans do to other fans. It's what keeps it fun as long as it stays somewhat respectful. I understand you taking, taking pokes is going to get under certain people's skins. But just remember... It's the internet. Don't take everything so personal. Bottom line is this. Dave said it perfect in, in terms of Slavkowski. He's the most NHL-ready player from the draft. I believe it. I believe it. Does he have one point on nine games this season? Yes, he does. Should he have more? 
Yes, he should. Does he look lost out there? No, he does not. Has he improved from last year? Yes, he has. Oh, should definitely. they maybe you know change what? the lineup composition on the second line and give it a different look? Probably. Now, you know, I'll leave that to the coaching, but in my humble opinion, I think maybe you got to do something there. Well, but ultimately, you, you, I believe you endanger the player a bit more in the confidence factor, like Dave's suggesting, if you do send them down, you're like, you're going to kill it there, kid. You're you're a big guy. You're going to get in there, top line minutes and Laval, and it's going to be great. And what does happen? Now, I believe his character is strong. I think this is a very strong-minded individual. I think that he can take it. I just don't see the necessity to put him through that because, like we're all saying, they're playing well. They have a winning record as a team. It's a good environment. You got Marty St. Louis there. You got you got things that are happening at the NHL level that you might not be able to get normally. So why not utilize it while it's there? I don't. To me, I don't see the benefit of sending him down. The Montreal at, Canadiens at chose a path. They chose a path to play him in the NHL and make him part of the top six, top nine of that roster. And to Dave's point, I think if you just break that path and say send him to the AHL, it'll just show also that they don't know what the heck they're doing either. That's the way I see it. There's a chance that it, it could backfire on them. This is the path you chose. You brought in certain people who, who in, in certain personnel that their strengths are development. Then let it be that. I rather, I know that if I was an NHL player or a hockey player, I'd rather be under Martin St. Louis tutelage, given his track history and everything he's done in, in the NHL, than under Jean Francois Houle in the AHL. You know, and it's no it's no slight to Jean Francois Houle. I'm just saying he he's not Marty Saint Louis. Last That's, year, it's fair. last year when we were seeing Slavkovsky play, I would have said, you know what, this guy is struggling to keep up with the NHL. He's struggling. He's reaching. He's sticking his head out. He's getting these blindside hits. He's struggling a little more. This year, I can see the progression. I can see that he's he's slow. It's it's going to take time. We need patience here. But he's slowly figuring things out. Is he still is he perfect? No what hockey player is, but he's getting there. And he's only 19 years old. He needs time. What hockey player is? I don't know. A couple names come to mind, but I'll leave that. I feel like that's low-hanging fruit, <laughs> to be fair. I, and, what, and I, I also feel ahead, like Dave. it's unfair to compare him to Kotkaniemi in the sense that, like the, the, I mean, I, I hate to say it's unfair to Kotkaniemi, but the Habs reached on Kotkaniemi. I think it's proven. I think that everybody agrees now. They reached in positional need, and they went and got a guy who was not – in any business way, shape, or form, supposed to be drafted third overall, in my opinion. And so, you know, Slavkovsky, I think that's why the expectations are so high. It's because there's, you know, there was these hype videos and this, and you saw what he did all over the place, and you kind of expected him to come in and really perform right right off the bat. And I think that patience is key at the end of the day. And if Kotkin Yemi could get, you know, needs uh, need, you need patience with him, you're going to need patience with Slavkovsky as well. Just because he's drafted more and he was more NHL ready, it doesn't mean that it's not going to not going to take some time. No, it's very rare for someone to step into the NHL and be a superstar. That's a different mold of player that Slavkovsky just isn't. Yeah, it, that's, it, that's, that's just, very look fair. The, look at the player on the ice, though. Because really, when it comes down to it, you got the people that are clamoring that, that he's a bust or this, that are solely looking at his stat line. Yeah. It's not the case. I think most educated fans that are watching it, not Habs fans, even just hockey fans, if you were to look at him last year in his body of work and look at him this year, you see a very, there, very steep progression. It's, there's going to be some fans, good. Matt. Matt, Matt and Dave, there's going to be some fans that are Habs fans, but because they didn't get the player that they wanted on that draft year, Slavkovsky is going to always be a bust. They didn't get Cooley. They didn't get Shane Wright. They're going to always be bent out of shape and angry about that. So any little time or any little yeah, funk that Slavkovsky is <laughs> going to go in, they're just going to jump in and jump into that pool and start you know, causing the waves that they want to cause. That's just I mean, who they are and how they are. I mean, till this day, you're having people pit, pissed off because guess what? Montreal should have taken Logan Cooley now because he's got six six assists in eight games, but he has zero points on five on five hockey and no goals and no goals. Well, that's why I said six assists. Um, and then you have Shane Wright, who everyone's like, oh, he should have been the number one. Three other teams passed on him, and he's st he's still playing in the HL, and he you know he was sent even lower than that last year. So what? It's, it was it's not. Less, it's less about the draft, draft, though, dude. 
it's less about where like i don't think people are really talking about that much anymore i think ultimately it just comes down to this is a first overall pick mm -hmm. and most first overall picks go directly to the nhl and stay in the nhl and they they produce not tremendous amount but they produce and i think after nine ten games with only one point that's where certain level-headed fans are saying hmm, maybe something should happen they don't they're not necessarily coming with pitchforks saying they have to send him to the hl but they're looking at it and saying maybe it's time i think all of us are in agreement again to summarize we wouldn't send him down we like what we're seeing out there he's being victim he's a victim of bad chances bad finishing of his line mates for the most part um I just, I think, I think it's a matter of flip the coin and all of a sudden he'll get like a whole bunch of points in a row and we might not really be talking about it once they start actually they should, finishing they some of those great passes. Him on power play. They should also try him on and he should get more power play time. I don't disagree with that either. Um, I don't, we're, we're getting close to our time here, boys. There was one more thing I wanted to talk about quick, quick. I think you might guess what I want to talk about, but I'll just say it anyways. Goaltending. Hmm. Goaltending, I think, for the most part, I think most people will agree, has been far better than anybody could have anticipated. Um, while it's still early in the season, the Habs are still carrying the three goaltenders that they got now. Would now be a good opportunity to sort of focus on shopping one of them because of the stellar play that they're kind of putting out there. And you have certain teams that have postseason aspirations that are dealing with really poor goaltending. I'm thinking of teams like LA, for example. Do you start to dangle these guys right now? Or do you leave well enough alone, leave the rotation, keep them going as they're going, stay to whatever plan that they currently have, and see what happens later on in the season? The problem is there's no cap space. Nobody, The teams that are that are aspiring for, to, for a Stanley Cup run have no cap space. So, you know, some people are, are suggesting that Allen's the guy that ideally you want to move just for the cap and for a future and all that. And we've spoken about this. And and right now he's out of the three goalies, he's definitely playing best. And teams don't have the cap, the space to fit him. Now Montembeau is a digestible cap for a lot of teams, but even then it's it's harder it's hard for teams to kind of fit in that million dollars that they have to. You know, how many teams are, are playing an LTIR? I think what was that I think like 13 teams, 14 teams? My friend, when there's a will. There's a way. There is a way. Uh, people I'm sure, paid I'm sure a lot of money to make this kind of thing happen. I think it's going to get solved soon. I just Montreal's in a position right now where they don't have to do anybody any favors. You need a goalie, pay what you need to pay to get this goalie. But would you LA shop one? Yeah, of course, because you have three. Like there's just think... three sitting in NHL every night. Every game, there's somebody out there that's not playing hockey in the Montreal goaltending rotation and is eating hot dogs, and that's not good for anybody. So less so no. about the stellar play, more so about the fact that, again, there is three of them, and there shouldn't be three of them. That's more where you stand. Pick your two, pick your two horses that you're going to run with for the rest of the year and move one. And if that All one right. happens to become something good on another team, then so be it. It's not the first time that a player that leaves Montreal does something for another team. And it could also be that that goalie just becomes, you know, a Charlie Lindgren and just becomes a, a backup for the rest of their career. That's not a bad thing, but I, I know losing a player to waivers, that's that's not an option to me. No, so I think that's trade fair. something. I think that's fair. And and see what you get. But right now Montreal's in the is in the driver's seat in this in this regard. I think that they were trying, probably hoping that by now something would be get, get done. You know, I think that they were trying to hoping that Tampa would get desperate or hoping another team got desperate and, and blew them away with an offer. And obviously it hasn't happened. And so it's just, you have to look and it's like, Jake Allen's playing well. I mean, you could argue with the first game against the Leafs was a bit of a disaster. They're playing well, the goaltenders. Are they playing well enough to like, you're going to give up the farm for, for, for a goaltender like Jake Allen or, or, you know what I mean? Like I, from a Montreal perspective. Yeah. Okay. They're performing better than, than, than expected. They, they're playing team. they're playing pretty well like the record they have today is you can almost say the majority of that is because of the goaltending that they've been getting okay again though it's very small sample size it, it's just no to doubt. me it's it's like if i'm because we tend to look at it from a habs perspective right and like you look at it and you're like oh yeah habs have three goaltenders it makes logical sense if you're the general manager of another team and you need a goaltender you kind of look at Montreal, but they're like, man, do I really want to give up for Jake Allen? Do I really like it? Doesn't like if you're a fan of another team, 
looking for a goaltender, would you be super excited to trade a good prospect for well, Jake Allen or a pick for like? Would you? It's honesty, in all honesty. Listen, Dave. Like I, I, I mentioned, no. I mentioned, so, in the, so, I mentioned before the depth, the goaltending depth across the NHL is probably the worst I've ever seen. So now, but somebody like it. Jake Allen is actually could be valuable to some teams. But Matt, you did mention the Tampa Bay Lightning, okay? Well, Tampa I said Bay, LA, had, but yeah. I think I yeah, mentioned Tampa. Let's this say Tampa. <laughs> okay, somebody, somebody on this right now mentioned Tampa. But Tampa is proof that they just grab a random goalie in Johansson and they're getting success from because of the way the team is built in front of them. Right. Well, that's it. All right. So, so, so you, not you know, it's much ado about nothing. Then you're <laughs> saying you're, it's like at this point it's either too early no. or they've been looking to do it and they couldn't do it. It's, it's so too early. It's too early. You're, you're not going to see. I don't think you're going to see a trade till the Christmas, either just before the Christmas break or shortly after. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to know how you guys stand. I mean, whoa. No, well, so passionate again, about three goalies. Excuse me. Well, we, we, we said it before that it's not ideal to be rotating three goalies. Of and, course and look, not. Primo's not. Primo played one game so far out of, uh, what, nine games? And played one against probably game. one of the better teams they played against and actually did not bad until did, all those goals came in the bad. third. Ish. Yeah, <laughs> ish. Ish, right? So, yeah. again, it's not an ideal situation. Even Carolina has three goalies, but they're able to send Kachetkov down. Mm -hmm. Montreal doesn't have that luxury because the moment they put Primo on waivers, he's gone. Well, that's what everybody keeps saying until you put him on waivers and he passes. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just saying to say, I was curious your stance, given how the well that they were playing, do you think that maybe this would have pushed certain teams to be like, oh, hmm, maybe there is something there and no. we better get on this fast? You guys don't think so. That's no, fine. I think, I think a team like LA might want to look at either Monty or Primo, but they're not going to have an appetite okay. for... Uh, for Allen. The thing is, is that like you're for, you're again as a Habs fan, you're looking to it in a vacuum. Jake Allen's played four games this year. J Sam Mondo has played three. Like I know overall in nine games, goaltending for the Canadians has been good. Yes. But each individual player has played three or four games. Like that that's not well, enough. And that's it's why I'm saying by the Christmas by the Christmas break. I always say this: the real season of the, the real NHL season starts after Game 15. All right. That's when so things start to stabilize. Games to go. Defense. Yes, around game 15, 16, 17, around their game stabilizes. The fans start to figure out their stuff. Other players who had slow starts start to wake up because there's some players right now that had some really odd starts that if you look at their, their careers, you're saying, okay, this, this is a flash in the pan. There's no way you're going to be on pace for 200 points or 140 points in like 72 goals. It's no, not going to happen. For sure, for sure. That's, uh, that's, that's my stance on it also. And more, more. I'm more interested at this point now for for those that stuck around to the end. Thanks very much for listening. I'm curious about your, the listeners, your uh, sort of view on Slavkovsky. What would you do with him? Do you agree with us that everything is pretty much good eye test wise, and he's just not getting lucky with finishes? Um, and you'd keep him there, or would you send him down? What What's your stance? Uh, what would you do with Sean Monaghan as well? Is something else I'd like to know. A lot of people seem to be opposite sides of this. Like, definitely get rid of him because he's hot. Or, no, definitely got to keep him. Curious to know what you guys have to think about that. Please let us know in the comments of the video below. Um, otherwise, thanks very much, as always, for listening. Uh, like and subscribe if you haven't already. would appreciate that like we do. And until next time, for Vito and Dave, I'm Matt, and this was... Get Pucked.